what would make a much-loved local physician, a medical man who took a sworn oath to heal, lay waste to over 250 of his elderly patients, deliberately administering an overdose using a pharmaceutical heroin. On this episode of Diagnosis to Murder, with the assistance of forensic psychiatrist Shoham Das, we will attempt to answer that very question. An estimated 6.1 per 100,000 of the general world population will be murdered this year. What makes a killer? Is it a trait that we all share as sentient beings? Or is it something unique to the individual? Brought on by nurturing in a rage, we live in a time where lies and manipulation are the dueling blades of the day, where life is cheap, a commodity. Welcome to Dead Bug's Diagnosis to Murder with your host, Dead Bug, with co host, forensic psychiatrist. Dr. Shaham Das. There are not many of us who enjoy going to the doctors, myself included. Perhaps it's because when we walk through that door of our local physician, we're admitting to ourselves that we are only clocks made of flesh and blood, slowly winding down. And our doctor is the proverbial clockmaker who can only stave off and delay what we know to be imminent. There have been very few documented incidences throughout history where the doctor, the nurse, the caregiver has ignored their sworn oath to care, to heal, and turned on their patients to take a life. A life that they took an oath to preserve. And in the mid-1990s, Dr. Harold Shipman was one of those physicians who ignored his oath. And he started to take the lives of his patients. And what better way to understand those heinous crimes than with the assistance of Dr. Das. Hello, cruel world. My name is Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist based in London in the UK. But I assess mentally disordered offenders in courts, in prisons, and in locked psychiatric units. And also, I work as an expert witness, which means that I give professional evidence in courts during criminal trials, including murder trials. If you're interested in this kind of area, you should definitely go and check out my YouTube channel, A Psych for Sore Minds. I dissect a smorgasbord of topics related to criminality and mental illness and the crossover between the two. Okay, doctor, it's time to put you to work and show that you're more than just a pretty face. Who is that? Dead bug. How you doing, my friend? I'm sure you got lots of questions for me. Bring them on. Not so fast, Slick. Although I know you know everything about everything, I'm still gonna give you a refresher course. Dr. Das, I would like you to meet Dr. Harold Shipman. And I'm gonna go out on the limb here and say that you two never bumped into each other at the gym. Harold Frederick Shipman was born in Nottingham, England in 1946. And it's just about as a swell of a place as it looks. And I'm guessing that the English teeth were as messed up then as they are now. Born to working class parents. The middle of three kids, nothing really stood out about Harold, and he wasn't particularly intelligent. But he was a mama's boy, and he wanted to please her and make good. That's why when she died of cancer and Harold didn't grieve, loved ones were concerned. After all, he'd been the one at her bedside caring for, giving her her medicine. It was just out of high school that he banged up his first girlfriend. They got married a couple of months later. And although someone with average grades, he signed up to medical school, which many put down to him trying to please his dead mother. Graduating in 1970, he and his new family moved to West Yorkshire. And it was during that time his patient list began to steadily grow. But it was also around this time that a serial killer named Stuart Sokoloff was about to start holding sway on the town. It was during this period that Shipman, now a junior doctor, was linked to the death of 12 babies, including a four-year-old girl whose mother had left the hospital room to go get a cup of tea and told Shipman to take care of her daughter. And he must have taken her literally 
because when she came back, her daughter was dead. And it's believed that this time that Shipman developed a taste for it. And when you get the taste, you get the hunger. And when you get the hunger, you need to feed. It was during this period that while having a growing family in practice, he also had a growing drug dependency to the same pharmaceuticals he was feeding his patients, eventually being arrested for forging those prescriptions. And although the local practitioners were notified, Shipman was not struck off and was still able to practice being a doctor, which history is now documented had disastrous results. At this time, Shipman announced to his partners that he was leaving the practice and moving to Hyde, Manchester with its 3,000 patients to start up on his own. And it was now alone without other doctors watching that he could practice his secret indulgence. And the murderer now went into a free fall. And perhaps it was that freedom without his fellow doctors looking over his shoulder that caused Shipman to go off the rails and become a serial killer. And it's impossible to say how many of his patients he sent to the grave early. But there's one thing for sure. If you were getting a home visit from Dr. Shipman, you better have your affairs in order, because it may have been your last. At one point, he'd killed 16 elderly women who all lived on the same small street. And while Shipman was good for the housing market, the pigeons weren't getting fed as much. But he started getting greedy, signing patients' wills over to himself. And family members started calling into question why loved ones would leave everything they owned to the family doctor. Even the building's janitor started calling the cops and saying that things weren't right. When they started investigating, it didn't take long to put two and two together. Especially since he had half the information stored on his computer. Print death certificates before his patients were dead, cremating the bodies to avoid an autopsy making Shipman England's most prolific serial killer. And in the end, he denied the families the peace of mind that they desired, and he hanged himself. Nice guy, huh? Okay, Das, now you got the skinny, let's put you to work. By all accounts, Harold Shipman was a doctor from a bygone era. He made home visits, which was unheard of at the time in the UK, and in fact, he encouraged them. He'd pop in unannounced to check if his patients were all right, he seemed like a dedicated healer. In fact, when evidence started coming out and he was being accused of these murders, family members of the victims still stood by him, saying it was impossible. Is this how he got away with these crimes for so long? So I think the thing about Shipman is that he, he was quite caring and he had an empathetic bedside manner. And I think that's all part of his charm. He was quite a gentle character and quite unassuming in his manner. So he appeared quite dedicated. He went above and beyond doing home visits when he didn't have to, spending a lot of time with his patients. So I'm saying all this to make the point that I think that he lowered everybody's suspicions. He lowered their guard. And I think there was also on top of that, something that shouldn't be overlooked is there was a degree of deference towards Mr. Sh uh, Dr. Shipman because he was like a middle-class, quite well-to-do, quite posh doctor and he was working in a northern kind of town. So I think all of these things in combination meant that people uh, looked up to him more than the average person. I do agree with you there, and unless you live in England, you don't realize how strong the class system is. Shipman had a very close relationship with his mother, who died of lung cancer when he was 17. And during this time, he regularly saw her injected with morphine to manage her pain and the suffering. At this point, are the seeds being planted for what would become Harold Shipman the serial killer? Or is this part of Harold Shipman's psyche still developing? So my boy Sigmund Freud coined the phrase repetition compulsion. And he described where people would recreate these situations unconsciously in order to make sense of their traumatic situation. So I suppose, is it possible a stretch that Shipman was doing that? He was recreating the dynamic with his mother when he was killing his patients. It's possible, I think, although Freud did take a lot of cocaine, so you have to take everything he says with a pinch of coke. I do think, having said that, that there would have been somehow, Shipman would have mixed up his emotions, uh, his love for his mother with the act of mercy of putting her out of the pain. So I think this all got kind of conflated in his, in his warped mind. Having said all that, I still think at that point in the time when he was, you know, a, an adolescent looking after his mother, I still think there's still a huge step between those 
thought processes and intentionally wanting to kill people. So I don't think he's yet gone through the, the process of deciding to become a killer. I think that happens much later on when he was a GP. And I think that a lot of that was actually opportunistic. Like he saw an opportunity much later on in his career, not back then. Now it's interesting that you should mention Freud and narcotics. At last count, they figure Shipman killed 250. I mean, that's what they could prove. And he ended up becoming addicted to painkillers. The same painkillers by chance that he had killed his patients with. Do you think his disposition towards pharmaceuticals could have moved into an addiction to killing his patients? That power of being God? Was Shipman getting off by playing our creator? So I think there's definitely some sort of quite subtle, egotistical, narcissistic trip that he gets from controlling life from holding it in his hands. And I do actually get a sense that he sees himself as a god in a way. I mean, it's quite an odd self-perception because, as I said, he's timid and he's quite shy. And he was well respected in the community, but he wasn't, you know, flashy. He wasn't a show-off. So I think that because of maybe Despite, or maybe even because of his timid nature, this would be one scenario where he has total control, where he can literally control life just like a god. Now, Das, we have a situation here where a man is killing people and he's getting away with it. And in part, it's because he's a doctor. A group we traditionally associate with trust, along with nurses and others in the medical profession. In fact, it was a janitor who first raised the alarm. That and a cab driver who had been dropping off the patients at Shipman's and they'd been dying in his surgery and not coming back. And these guys were ignored because they were nobodies. Now that being said, do you think a crime like this could ever happen again? Because we're now more conditioned to not trust people? To question authority? That's a, that's a complicated area, it's a difficult question. I think the public are definitely more kind of aware and less trusting of all healthcare professionals, including doctors. I think it's fair to say that we're a more kind of litigious uh, com community and society, aren't we? We sue doctors nowadays quite you know, openly, whereas a generation, definitely two generations ago, the concept of seeing like a, a doctor didn't even really exist. You know, everyone just assumed that doctors always did their best, so if they did make some kind of clinical error or poor medical judgment that it was you know by accident so I think that probably people are more comfortable now in raising alarms or questioning questioning people's standards of cares and raising their alarms earlier so I don't think it's necessarily less likely to occur now but it's less likely to continue for such a prolonged period of time such especially a murderous kind of rampage or a lot of deaths compared to before now, as I'm sure you're aware of, there's currently a case going through the UK court system where a neuronatal nurse, Lucy Letby, has been accused of killing seven newborn babies and probably more. And just like Shipman, even with the overwhelming proof against her, she has pleaded not guilty. And it seems like they permeate this arrogance like they're untouchable because they're caregivers. When reportedly a mother of one of the babies walked in and interrupted Letby, who was in the process of murdering her child. And the child was letting out this horrific scream. Letby turned to the mother and smiled and said, trust me, I'm a nurse. Do you see any similarities in these two cases and the possible motivations? Well, it is a, a horrendous, but also quite fascinating case. It's difficult to know her exact thought processes because there's not really that information in the public domain yet. And also I should say that she's not technically been proven guilty yet, although the evidence is kind of stacked against her, but assuming that she is guilty of these horrific crimes of killing babies, there's no psychiatric assessment in the public domain, but my kind of um, speculation would, there, would be that there must be some overlap between her thoughts, beliefs, cognitive processes and that of Shipman. And I imagine that would be her, this feeling of being in control and of having ultimate power and this kind of sense of pure domination and having the, these fragile lives in a hand with the ability to kind of end them at her murderous whim. Now Das, 80% of Shipman's victims were women. I got a theory, it's because men hate going to the doctors. And women, especially old ladies, they love it because they can chit chat, have a cup of tea and complain a bit. I mean, you know how it is with old ladies, Das. Even if you throw them off a cliff, they'll be talking on the way down. So does this make them more likely to regularly visit a physician? Yeah, so there are definitely more women, uh, female victims for Shipman. I think perhaps women, especially at that kind of, of, of that age, 
would have been even more differential towards him than men uh, because he was a man in authority. And remember, this was like a generation ago when most doctors were male. Nowadays, especially in certain areas like paediatricians and GPs, general practitioners like Harold Shipman was, there's actually more females than males. But back then it was almost all male doctors. And I think another factor is that women live longer, don't they? They have a longer life expectancy. So there would have been a kind of skew towards having more older women patients. So more vulnerable elderly uh, women to prey on for Shipman. Just to expand on the subject of women living longer, now it's time for me to share my expertise with you. They live longer, Das. Well, that's because they nag us to death, and we just want out. And death seems like the easiest option. Apologies, but I just had to get that off my chest. Now, there have been those who've said that Shipman gave his patients a millionaire's death. Clean, no suffering, quick, which most of us won't have the luxury of experiencing, and there will be an element of pain and suffering involved. Do you think he was compassionate to these people in any way? I'm of the mindset that he was just fed up of listening to these old ladies complaining about the aches and the pains and he was just shut up and take two of these. Uh, disdain towards old people? With respect, I think you're dead bugging up the wrong tree. I don't think that Shipman felt irritated or disdainful towards any of his patients because he voluntarily, repeatedly went out of his way to spend time with them and to help them. You know, he would go out of hours, he would spend much longer than he needed to just to chat to them and their families and you know obviously what he did was horrific but he actually did treat people well apart from when he was killing them so i feel that it wasn't disdain i feel like it was almost the opposite i think that shipman got some sort of perverse pleasure in being able to kind of be in a position to help the vulnerable so it was almost like these mercy killings and they're not mercy killings in a way that seem logical to us because those people didn't need to die but I think maybe in his own twisted, warped mind, Shipman felt that they would die anyway within years. So he was kind of giving them this peaceful option. And again, I just really want to stress that this is not a logical thought process and I'm in no way excusing Shipman's actions. I'm generally against mass murder, but I'm just saying maybe from his perspective, that's what he thought. Well, I'm glad you're generally against mass murder, Das. <laughs> And that puts aside some of the concerns I had about you, and now I can publicly reinstate that dinner invitation. Now I'm going to jump back to this Nurse Lucy Letby case, the accused baby killer. And she was caught relatively early because of the unnatural amount of deaths that were occurring in the maternity ward that she worked on. And they were able to identify that she was present on each of the shifts that one of these babies died or were injured. Clearly Shipman got away with it so long because the elderly die, and this is what we've grown up to expect. Now, do you think in any way that this was part of Shipman's plan? Or in some ways, did society inadvertently aid him by our views on the elderly, and this should have been spotted much earlier? So I think society's views on the el elderly definitely did help Shipman. So as a family doctor, as a GP, he would have treated a whole range of patients. It wasn't like he'd specialised in an elderly patient. He'd have seen different diseases, different presentations, different ages, but he specifically decided to prey on the elderly. So that is not a coincidence in my view. I think that elderly people dying would definitely raise less suspicion. So there'll be less kind of um, time and effort put into inquests compared to say, you know, a healthy teenager dying. So I think this emboldened Shipman and it allowed him to continue his killing spree for longer. Now Shipman, to date, is the only doctor in the UK to be convicted of murdering one of his patients. Do you think this gives a general idea how we view the healers? And we just don't want to accept that they could be killers? Yeah, absolutely. I, I do think that the way that we, we view doctors, that we view medical professions, uh, we do idolise them. And even looking back at Shipman now, even knowing what we know, he doesn't have the typical traits of being a violent offender, with the exception of kind of being male. So he's much, much older than people who commit typical violence. He's not antisocial in his attitudes. He didn't have like a criminal history. He was polite, he had a good bedside manner. So yeah, I think doctors in general would, would raise less suspicions and even more so Shipman and his presentation and his personality would make it really hard to predict or pick him out as somebody that would be such a vile mass murderer. Now I'm going to wrap this up, Daz, because I know you're a busy man and you got uh, more important things to do than to be talking with mooks like me. But in closing, do you think this sort of thing can be prevented in the future? 
Or will we, the public, always to a point be blinded by practitioners, you know, therefore potential victims, to medical professionals? Because there is such a great level of trust here. Um, I, I would highlight that they, these kind of cases are exceptionally rare. Nevertheless, there's always going to be a lower suspicion, suspicion on doctors than there are for the general public because I think we have this archetype of doctors being like upstanding pillars of society. And I think that we will always be reluctant to accept that some people will, you know, commit, abuse their position and commit this type of violence. I think that our preconceived notions of various roles in society will always overrule our logic. But statistics don't lie. So to me, it's about ignoring our prejudice and looking at the numbers. So if there are too many deaths uh, that one particular doctor is responsible for or one particular department in a hospital, I mean, you need to look into that, don't you? It's not, I'm not always saying that it'll be suspicious, it could just be medical incompetence, but we can't ignore uh, those findings, I guess. Just to go on a bit of a tangent. A tangent? Ah, oh, I love a tangent, Das. I regularly go on a tangent about men who sit down to take a piss, but go ahead. Your viewers might find this interesting. So I'm actually an NHS doctor. A lot of people don't know or don't care. Psychologists aren't medical doctors, but psychiatrists such as myself. So I have to train in all of medicine, went to medical school, blah, blah, blah. So the reason I'm saying all this is not to flex, although a little bit, is because Harold Shipman's case has actually been integral in how the GMC, the General Man Medical Council, now assess and revalidate re doctors. So in the past, the GMC would take a reactive kind of reaction to doctors getting in trouble, say if there were patients' complaints or a problem with their performance, they would be investigated. But now, but they didn't used to do any kind of routine check of competency. Whereas everything changed because of two high profile cases um, and speeded up the kind of, the need for extra observation of, doctor, of doctors and towards licensing them and relicensing them. So in September 1998, there was a man called Rodney Ledwa Ledward who was a gynecologist in Kent and he was struck off after being on the medical register for many years. He didn't kill anybody, but he just provided really bad care, poor care for many, many um, decades. And that very same month was when Harold Shipman was arrested and his catalogue of killings, which lasted 23 years, was kind of um, exposed. So the result of this was this whole new, really long and really complicated process called revalidation, which has been going on for well over a decade now, possibly, possibly closer to, to 20 years. And it's just like this huge admin process that doctors have to go through every four years. So I'm going to have to do this next year. And there's loads of little kind of administrative hoops you have to jump through. So you have to get feedback, anonymous feedback from uh, like something like 15 of your colleagues that you've worked with over the years and 15 patients. And you have to like write out these like case-based discussions where you discuss complicated cases with your peers and they kind of, they rate you on your ability to diagnose and you know, to, to communicate with patients and to write your notes, blah, blah, blah. But this is my issue with it. It's kind of, it can be a bit of a popularity contest because you've got four years to do it and the doctors get to pick and choose which patients and which colleagues do the assessment. So I guess what I'm saying is it, it's there to pick out these rotten eggs, but I don't think it's necessarily an effective uh, method to, 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 to do that. For example, I'm pretty sure Harold Shipman would have passed his revalidation because, you know, obviously he went around killing elderly people, but nobody knew that at the time, right? And he was respected uh, and seen as a hard worker and very conscientious by patients and by his colleagues. So if they would have had to fill out assessments on his behalf for validation, he would have passed that shit, I think. I would also close by saying that many doctors, myself included, think that it's just a bit of a pain in the ass revalidation. It's a huge paperwork admin task. It's very inconvenient. Those are kind of my thoughts, but at the same time, I don't want to damage my career about by talking smack about the GMC. Well, thank you for explaining that to us, doctor. And myself, I do find that interesting because I like to know what's been put in place to protect my family. And I agree with you. As with any safeguarding practices, there are ways around it and it's open to abuse. Right, that's so all I have to say. You've got to go chiggity chiggity check out my YouTube channel, Psych for Sore Minds. It's a smorgasbord of topics related to true crime with a sprinkling of mental illness. Recently, I have done a detailed video on the Daryl Brooks case and his shenanigans and his behavior in court. Is he mentally unwell? Does he have a personality disorder? You're going to have to see my video on my channel. All right, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Shout out to my homeboy, Deadbug. Always love to be a guest spot on your channel. I hope I'm educating your viewers. Stay in touch, let's do it again soon. Peace out, stay euthymic.
and remember. And doctor, thank you once again for lending your valuable learned time to us all. You've been a great sport as always, and I will see you all on the next installment, A Diagnosis to Murder.